let me start by saying, before I go through the individual issues here, I think the motivation for Europe changed underway. And uh, I think we are in a process where a European um, value-based life is becoming increasingly, is getting increasingly under pressure. Um, and I think we need Europe today more than ever for defending a European vision of life. And uh, for that reason, I think we need a new narrative of Europe. Uh, the old narrative of avoiding war is still valid and is nice. And economic progress is also important and also still nice. But the really important new fact is that we have to defend individuality. I think in a global situation in which these values come, become a small minority. And none of our countries will have any chance whatsoever to def defend against pressures from very big countries which are not so interested in specifically our way of looking at human dignity. And therefore, in the first element here, there are, you see seven elements. Four of them are more of a content, policy content nature. Four and the three others, the blue ones, are more of an organizational nature. Let me start with the content elements. I think in the novel narrative for Europe, we should put the notion of human dignity uh, at the center. I'm by training a philosopher. I then went to work at the Max Planck Institute for Physics and uh, I'm now running a research center for studying how the brain copes with complexity and how we can support it in this challenge. But taking my philosophical head, I would argue that the notion of human dignity is probably the biggest cultural achievement that has been made on our way to Homo sapiens. Yeah? I would say we are still quite a lot of Homo instrumentalis, and Homo sapiens is a good idea. <laughs> we are still on our way to it. And for that reason, <clears throat> I think we should have this, um, in a Kantian sense, uh, leitmotif, he called it regulative idea, something that you do not expect to achieve fully, but you are continuously trying to approach to come closer to it. So human dignity would be the center, I think, of the narrative how we argue for Europe. The second point, and I'm happy to raise this in Hungary, uh, is that I think homogenization is integration for idiots. Yeah? The biggest uh, asset we have in Europe is our historical cultural richness. And if we have bureaucracy driven ways of integrating that homogenize, we destroy our best asset. So I think we should have a completely novel um, uh, way of organizing uh, uh, Europe, and I find a typo here, recognizing, this G uh, should be a C, so recognizing our historical cultural diversity as our biggest asset. Now, directly from that follows that we need to completely reconsider what we fund from Europe. I would say the best way to utilize this diversity and richness <clears throat> is to transform Europe into a decentralized innovation and learning lab. So there are models developed how to cope with unemployment in Copenhagen, maybe a local situation. And if we make it mandatory for funding, that this is documented very well, also regarding the framework conditions, et cetera, et cetera, 
Then all of a sudden, Alicante can learn from it, or Milan or any other city. So utilizing this historical cultural richness means a completely different model of organizing Europe. And my leitmotif would be a decentralized innovation and learning lab for fostering innovation specifically at the interface between technological advances, advances and societal advances. So, and I would argue, if we do that well, five years down the road, ten years down the road, we can probably be the most thriving region in the world because all these big monolithic states do not have this evolutionary richness, this gene pool, this cultural gene pool from which to draw. But this is not the main vision of Europe. And I, I hope, uh, knowing some people who work closely for Mr. von der Leyen and knowing her background in medicine, which means a bit of biology as well, and a certain openness, I hope one can convince her that she really needs a kind of paradigm shift in this regard. I don't, I'm absolutely not sure whether it will work, but I think that's what would need to be done. Now, so internally, we should be an evolution breeder for novel solutions. Externally, we have to talk with one voice, because the old saying of Kissinger, what's the telephone number of Europe, is still valid. We have no organized representation. And I think there's a wonderful opportunity right now because we have no meaningful global order. Europe could develop one and could propose it and pioneer it. And I think eating our own dog food, we should design it not as a power politics based framework, but what I called here a global domestic policy. Because de facto, we are already integrated. The, the interdependencies in ecological, in economic, in technological terms are so enormous that just politics are lagging behind. And I think it's not far-fetched global domestic policy framework. So these are the four uh, content need. And I'm now coming to more architectural or methodological innovations. The most important one, which you see here in the center, is, I think, the traditional model to just force everybody to the same uh, way of cooperating with the others, the one-layer Europe, or the Procrustes Europe, as I would call it, is utterly stupid. We should switch to a multi-layer model. And my proposal would be not to go for a two-layer model. It has been discussed. But I think there are very good arguments for a three-layer model, where we have, at the lowest level, a free trade zone. And I would say we should not push for too much EU internal or external migration obligation there. Not at all. It's a free trade zone. And the Brits would be cordially invited to stay a member of that. It would be easy. We could avoid all this nonsensical hassle and distraction of political that we saw over the last three years. So lowest level, free trade zone. Above that, the middle level is an intergovernmental coordination level, a bit like the EU we have today. And then finally, there are those who want to move towards a federal model, and they are cordially invited to do so. And this may initially be just a small number of countries. Doesn't matter. What's important is that each nation, each member state, has the right to move upward, given uh, the country fulfills the requirements, or also move downward. I think it should be a flexible three-layer architecture. This would be a Europe that's really attractive, not this today's Procrustes Europe. Then we have here <coughs> novel forms 
of democratic participation, and already in my next slide I'm going to focus on that, because the problem is we have exploding complexity and democratic participation uh, patterns and methodologies uh, that sometimes are worse than in ancient times. Yeah? So there's a huge discrepancy between the requirements that an effective democratic process would have and the way how we do it. We have, now being a bit cynical, we have big garbage bags in different colors, red, black, blue, green, the parties, and we are entitled and invited every four years to opt for one of them. Most people don't like half of what's in the bag they choose. That's ridiculous on today's level of technology. That's ridiculous. So we definitely have to rejuvenate the model of democracy, making, inviting people to be more articulate about their preferences. Then they will also be more interested and will learn more. Um, so, so we need new forms of democratic participation. And the last point is just a methodological one, coming from this background in complex systems. We definitely have a very, very underdeveloped sophistication of the, of the methodological side of policy making today. We are running, most of the um, countries are running their ministries like chimneys. We need integrated policies because if a system gets more complex and you just consider changing something here without looking at what it implies and what it could be helpful, your space, your elbow room for acting collapses. So unless we move to integrated policy models in which different interventions in different policy realms mutually enable each other, we are not able to really shape the future development of society. And we see that. If I look at my own country, it's now at least 15 years of complete conceptual absence. Yeah? They could have closed the cupboard and put the government there, one wouldn't have realized it. There is no meaningful innovation concept in my country. And when Macron came, I think he had a marvelous impulse and fresh thinking. The proposals, the practical proposals he made were quite boring. But why couldn't my own government say, oh, we like your impetus, why not discuss what we do actually, and I'll come to some practical proposals on that, why not do something uh, really innovative, not just building bridges and railways and uh, other Keynesian stuff. So, uh, <coughs> integrated policy. The next thing is complex systems usually have, that's not very widely known, even in complex system theory, they have a relatively down uh, and hidden Archimedean point where you can shape the future development because there you shape the self-organizing mechanisms. So policies, if policy makers are clever, they look, search for these. Today, our party foundations, our planning staffs in the ministries are not capable, methodology-wise, to do that. And therefore, we see very poor politics, which is usual um, cosmetic measures on, the surf measures on the surface. And then the last point, voice here, is bifurcation-oriented implementation strategies. That means, just as a simple metaphor, if you imagine a little ball is rolling down the Alps, then for a while it goes through a valley and you cannot have a major impact on its future direction, even if you invest a lot of energy. But every now and then it goes over the back of a hill and with a little impulse you can have a major impact on the future direction. That's called a bifurcation. So what we need in complex societal systems is bifurcation-oriented implementation of policies where we utilize these inherent features of complex dynamics, which we don't, again, for the same reason, methodological deficit of the people in charge of that. So summing up, 
I think this would be the seven pillars of really rejuvenating Europe. And with that, I'm just, these are just remarks which I mainly made verbally. I'm now coming to the rejuvenation of democracy. <clears throat> Let me just walk you through how I would see a citizen, a citoyen, in the future participating in political dialogue. First thing, I'm entering that space and I'm getting an overview what are the actual ongoing debates. Uh, we do that with a technology that's called Topicule uh, and we reform university studies so you can bring all the knowledge, say, of physics into one such super molecule and then the students from day one can zoom in, get the overall picture, zoom out, zoom in to the original Einstein paper. As a, it's a completely different world of teaching, academic teaching. I assume some of you are academic teachers. We just, end of last year, was implementing this. We tried in Germany. My university, LMU in Munich, has a budget of 500 thousand K per year for methodological innovation. That doesn't bring you very far. So I looked around, a friend of mine was president of the University of Singapore. His budget for that exactly the same purpose is 50 million per year. So where did we implement it? In Singapore. All the basic research was done here, but it was implemented at NTU in National Nanyang Technology University in Singapore. That's a pity, seen from a European point of view. I enjoy, from my cosmopolitan kind of ambitions, I enjoy that, obviously, and it's a very good cooperation. And we even, in the first year where we implemented the new study with this topic, we were in the American ranking, number one, two Stanford, three MIT, four Harvard, etc. So we beat them all. And this is European basic research. I want to encourage you. We should not be afraid of Anglo-Saxon competition. In both, I would argue, in certain aspects of information technologies for modern healthcare, and specifically in edu edu education technologies, we are ahead. We are definitively ahead. And there's a, also a very clear reason why we are. The Americans, to a large extent, in their cognitive sciences, reduced the human brain in the 50s and 60s to a so-called Turing machine, to a computer. And once you have that metaphor for the brain, there's hardly anything you can learn uh, for, uh, for artificial intelligence. Now we, now with 240 people studying how the brain does that, Intel turns to us to come and see how neuromorphic computing and neuromorphic AI might work. But we are unable to really utilize this strength of If I go to the ministry in Berlin and I preach, automotive industry has a relatively short half-life time remaining. We need new strongholds for the European um, social economic fabric. They say, oh yes, that's wonderful. Uh, in 24, we plan to have a program in which you might get some funding. Yes. To hell, there I need to have the third product generation, otherwise I'm out of the competition. And that's the problem of Europe. And it really, and therefore I'm talking about Germany a lot, because it kind of materializes in this uh, Merkel inertia, so to speak. Anyhow, so coming back to this walk through the new form of democratic participation. First of all, you get a very convenient overview and you can get brief introductions on each of the subjects. What turned out to be very powerful, is also implemented there in Singapore in the new study track, is the so-called argumentation space map. You can chop up every debate, whether it's in philosophy about free will, whether it's in biology about the origin of life, 
whether it's in any other field, quantum physics, about uh, uh, the dynamics of quantum reduction, you can take every complex debate and chop it up into key components to which each theory, if it wishes to be taken serious, must give an answer, okay? And then you have here the alternative answers. And that means that you can represent here any theory in this overview format and very easily compare the different theories. I demand that of all my PhD students. Initially, they hate me for that because it's a lot of work to do that. But once they do it, they usually have at least one, if not so much, because they get a magnificent overview about the whole debate. So we can use that, has been developed for academic purposes. We use it in the EAGRA context for giving people who want to disc see the discussion about uh, whatever tax reform, woof, they get an overview and they can very easily and comfortably and joyfully um, understand what makes the debate click and what the relevant points are.